Hey there and welcome to Emmaus Road Online. It's great to have you with us. We're going to continue our Becoming series by listening to Jill Webber as she talks about Becoming in Community. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everybody. It's nice to see all of your beady little eyes over top of your masks. <laughs> Looking forward to the day when we could see all of our faces. And um, so we're just going to be continuing on our Becoming series. We've just as we're on a journey together as a congregation exploring how we can be disciples of Jesus and be formed and shaped into his image. We've talked about the role of God in this process and the role of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about our own effort and what we can do to make space for God to transform us. And today we're going to talk about how Christ likeness is formed in us in the context of community. So that's today for us. So with restrictions easing a little bit and scientists beginning to use words like endemic instead of pandemic, maybe we begin to wonder, is this, we don't know, the beginning of the end? We're not sure. For me, that's prompted some reflection on the last two years of life in and out of lockdown. And I'm very aware that many of you have had very different Circumstances. Some of you have lived alone, worked alone. Some of you have homeschooled four children, <laughs> you know, at home while you were trying to work. We've all experienced, we've gone through the last two years very, very differently. And so what I do not want to do is I don't want to project my own experience onto you. But when I look back at how I, I weathered the COVID storm, I noticed two things about myself. Number one, if I am left to my own devices with no external structures and no support, I can be fickle and inconsistent. So working from home, some days, some days I was focused and I was productive and other days, well, let's just say my get up and go got up and left. <laughs> you know, I remember on my couch, my couch is lopsided now because there was one spot that was my spot. I'm a bit like Sheldon in, uh, you know, the Big Bang Theory, he had his spot. Well, I have my spot on the couch, and I think the cushion in that spot since pandemic is about an inch lower than anywhere else on the couch. And I did have a pair of, of uh, workout trousers and, uh, that, that um, yeah, I, I kind of wore them out. <laughs> you know, the elastic waistband, they're comfy, you know, and, and I, it, yeah, I struggled sometimes, cut off from my regular routines and connections. You know, I had trouble holding it together. Maybe you guys are way more well-adjusted than I am and way more spiritual than I am, but, but um, I think some of us found it a little bit difficult, didn't we? Anybody? Don't have to put up your hand, but I see lots of nods. <laughs> the other thing I noticed that when, they, we did, when there were some times when I, I did have a little bit of structure and a little bit of support in place, I just did better. I'll talk about that in detail in a few minutes, but if I learn anything in life in lockdown, I learned how essential and how transformational community was for my life, for the cultivation of my inner space, my spirituality, and my overarching flourishing. And I wonder how many of us in our spiritual lives struggle with a sense of isolation, of loneliness, you know, many of us sincerely desire to become more like Jesus, and we battle with failure and disappointment. We wonder, why am I not being transformed? And how many of us slide into languishing and apathy and have times when our motivation just kind of fizzles and when our get up and go gets up and goes. And we're not designed to do life in God in isolation on our own. It's not designed that way. In fact, the individualized and private religion that many, many practice these days would not have been recognizable as discipleship in the first century. We're designed to be shaped and to be formed by God in the context of community because God is of God's self community, right? The Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is not good for God to be alone. <laughs> So he lives in this mysterious three-in-oneness. And then when God created humankind, he created one. And he's like, no one's not enough. It's not good for man to be alone. Man needs to be in community. And God creates the first community. 
This is how we are shaped. This is how we are made to live and to love and to learn and to grow with one another into the image of Christ. And so we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about stirring up one another. We're going to talk about sharpening one another. And we're going to talk about staying the course. So number one, Hebrews 10, 24 says we need to stir. <laughs> we just, it says to stir up one another with love and good deeds. And we've made reference to prayer, our prayer meetings at church. We started morning prayer at the beginning of the first lockdown. We quickly added midday and evening prayers as well. And so every day at 8, I would sign in to Zoom. And uh, we'd meet many, many of you. I have many deep friendships, actually, now. We'd meet many of you in, in a time of worship, reflecting on the scriptures, praying together for about 40 minutes or so. Honestly, for me, I don't know about you, but for me, it was a life and a soul saver. I have a confession to make. You ready for my confession? All right, Jill, the director of prayer at Emmaus Road, I don't always feel like praying. Don't tell my boss. Anyway. <laughs> and there were many, many days when I would just sort of drag myself out of bed with my fingernails and I felt depressed and disheveled and I didn't feel like doing anything, nevertheless praying with people. And I would stumble into the Zoom room, which we, um, we called it the upper Zoom. Anyway. <laughs> And I kind of turn on the screen all bleary-eyed, and it was amazing how all of your prayers and your presence and your faith and your enthusiasm and your endurance and your faithfulness and your love in Jesus carried me day after day. We said right at the beginning, these are not prayer meetings. This is a prayer community. We are a community gathered around the presence of of Jesus. And so we laughed together, we cried together, we praised together, we lamented together, we fought the fight to see people through COVID, we won some, we lost some, day in and day out. And between morning and midday and evening prayers, we've met almost 2,000 times over lockdown. And many of us would argue that it's been transformational, that God has profoundly shaped us in that season of being a community of shared practice. And so I just want to invite Holly to come up just to talk about how God shaped her during this time. I've got another microphone here. And because uh, you can't go to that many prayer meetings and look and be the same as at the beginning. Hey, all right. Tell us about that, Holly. Um, yeah. So when I first heard about morning prayers, I wanted to start getting a bit of a rhythm in, especially right at the beginning of lockdown. I was like, okay, let's take this, take this as an opportunity. And I started and I, I remember like not having, ever having my screen on because it was 8 a.m. I was like, I'm not going to get up and look pretty for that. So it was, just, it, was, it was just complete like, you know, video wasn't on and I'd chime in every now and again with a little prayer. And anyway, as time went on, I, you know, I started seeing other people like, kind of like not necessarily getting all dressed up for it like you know sometimes in pajamas so I was like okay I'm, I'm just gonna stay in my pajamas but I'm gonna I'm gonna put my video on and as time went on it um it actually did just start feeling like family because you know I, I when I started morning prayers I was just pregnant and now obviously my little girl's one so like this whole community work, worked through the whole of my pregnancy. And I even then were telling them about like, you know, when I went into labor, they were praying for me through my labor. And it was such an amazing community. But for me, um, there's been three really solid things about morning prayers and how it's shaped me, it's how it's changed me. Is the first thing, and, and actually the Lord has really asked me to bring that into the student ministry, those, those three things. But one thing is that it's consistent. Even when I'm not there, I know it's there. <laughs> And like, even when I'm not there, I miss it. And I'm like, gosh, so I should have done but, morning prayers. But you're morning. there a lot. I am there a lot. A lot, a lot. I, I, I yeah. love it. I, I absolutely love it. But when, yeah, when, I'm, when I've not done it, I'm like, oh, gosh, my whole day just looks different because I haven't gone on there and gone, morning, everyone, and, 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 and chatted about life. But yeah, so it's consistent. Uh, secondly, is that it's safe. It's, it's such a safe space. I don't get the world there. I just get what Jesus wants to do community church it's, it's a safe safe space for me to be honest about how I'm actually doing 
because other people are honest about how they're actually doing. And I've grown in my faith. We do the Bible, we read a Bible passage, at least, at least one Bible passage, but more, um, every single day. And it's completely transformed my walk, my prayer life. I like speak in tongues now more than ever because I've done it so much in morning prayers. And it's it's really transformed just my whole my whole rhythm my whole rhythm, so thank you. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Holly, for bringing yourself into the space. We're super excited. Of course, when Holly and Robbie then stepped into the role as, as our student pastors, we're just like, woo, it feels like that kind of just got birthed out of the, in the womb of the prayer Zoom, you know, and, and just really keen to see what God wants to do amongst students at Emmaus, so... Yeah, and you know what? It's not just morning prayer. You know, maybe your, your community of shared practice is your collective, right? Maybe it is going on walks with other kids together in, in the kids' program. Whatever your community is that you're gathered around the presence of Jesus, creating space for transformation, it can and it will change you. And I loved what you said. You talked about consistency and safety, honesty, and, and discipleship. Yeah, again around the presence of Jesus. So we'd, what we've done, we've done it together. We've stirred one another on to love and good deeds. So what does that look like for you? Well, you could come to morning prayer <laughs> or midday prayer or evening prayer, any of those times, or you know, really dig into your collective. Whatever that looks like for you in the life of Emmaus, we've got so much going on, so many ways to plug in. Let's stir one another on. Number two, let's sharpen one another. The scripture that says, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I used to think I was holy, and then I got married. And then I realized I was merely undisturbed. <laughs> so your spouse... And for those of you who are single, maybe let's, maybe it's, let's say your best friend or your sister or a family member. So I don't want to make this exclusive to marriages because God's at work in all of our primary relationships. Those of you who are married, who are married, your spouse is God's number one agent of sanctification in your life. I, all right. Or your best friend, right? Your boss at work. You know, we get these people who come into your life. And, and actually, Kirk, my husband and I, my husband's got like, he's got what he calls a two-minute speech that can save any marriage. And if he was here, he would do it. He loves, he loves sitting down with couples before they get married. And here it is. You ready for it? You get this one for free. <laughs> he says this, your spouse is going to trigger all of your issues and expose all of your selfishness and all of your bad habits, and all of your immaturity. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that's God's invitation to you into a holier life, to become more like Jesus. I wonder how many relationships, marriages, or best friend relationships, or sibling relationships, and some work relationships would, could be saved if we carried that framework of understanding. That we sharpen one another, our rough edges and our sparks. Graham Cook says this. I've said it before. I'll say it again. God gave us family to prepare us for our enemies. <laughs> we sharpen one another. My early days back in Canada, I realized that I was a little bit in danger and the danger of being a spiritual leader who had a public persona and a private persona that we're not the same. It's very easy to walk into a room and put on the Pastor Jill face. How are you doing? Great. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I knew I was in danger because I just, I just thought, oh, you know what? I need to be seen and I need to be known. And not just by my family, but I need to be seen and known by people that I'm discipling, that I'm in relationships with on my good days and on my bad days, my bad hair days. <laughs> And so we actually went in this experiment, my husband and myself, we developed a, a community house as part of our work back in Canada. So a number of us lived together in a house together. And I wanted to find out if I was holy or merely socialized. <laughs> and I discovered, of course, I was merely socialized. People eat all the peanut butter and anyway, 
don't replace the toilet roll, loo paper, you know, all of that stuff. <laughs> but I wanted people to call me on my bad habits and my bad behavior. I wanted to be delivered from a self-referential echo chamber that I, I kind of fortify and wall myself about by my personal preferences and my preoccupations. And sometimes I've got this big do not disturb sign in front of my life and in front of my heart. I wanted to be rescued from myself. And I remember telling one of my housemates, I love him so good, I said to him, I said, you know what? If, if I don't annoy you at all yet, he said, that's, I said, that's okay. It's just because you don't know me well enough. And he said, oh, no, that's, pro that's no problem at all. He said, you totally annoy me. <laughs> uh, and I've learned firsthand from Proverbs 27.6, wounds from a friend can be trusted. We sharpen one another. And I wonder sometimes, as we're thinking about discipleship and our lives together and our collectives and our friendship groups and our families, what could happen if we changed the social contract just a little bit? What would happen in our collectives if we committed to trying a spiritual practice together and then next week actually checked in with one another to see if you did it? Anybody? Would that be scary? Be like, oh no, I'm actually accountable to people, to growing in my relationship with Jesus, actually accountable. Like, we've, we've got this shadow of, you know, in the 90s, this sort of heavy shepherding. It's like, don't you tell me what to do, right? We were afraid of that. And so, but I think we swung too far the other way. And what if we actually changed the social contract? It's like, oh wow, you really wanted to, I don't know, you really wanted to read your Bible this week and you didn't. So, so what's that about? Why don't we explore that together? Why don't we get curious in God's presence at what the barriers are and how you might want to grow and to learn? What if we got a little braver with each other and changed the social contract? How might God be at work in that? And what can we learn from these communities of shared practice that we call 12-step programs, where alcoholics and drug addicts, they practice generous hospitality, they practice solidarity, brutal honesty, confession, and where they fight for one another's freedom. What if the church looked a little more like that? How might we grow? How, I might, how might we become the iron that sharpens iron? And then finally, how can we stay the course? Because God invites us, God invites me and you into a, a particular place with a peculiar people. The scripture says that we, we are a peculiar person. Look at the person beside you and go, you're a peculiar person. <laughs> So what if, what if God has engineered and orchestrated your current circumstances in order to accomplish his purposes in you and through you? What if God has got you in this particular place with this peculiar people because he's conforming you into the image of Jesus? What if God has you exactly where he wants you. This is a predictable process as we grow in community and as we grow in relationships with each other. First of all, you step into community and everybody's an angel. Oh, they're so wonderful. They love Jesus. They love us and our friendship groups, our collectives are like, oh, we get along so well. It's so great. I just love it. I can't wait to be there. That's phase one. <laughs> And then they morph and they change. And then we're into phase two and everybody is a demon. I'm like, oh man, they looked at me funny. I don't know. I sent them a WhatsApp and they didn't send a WhatsApp back in the first 30 seconds. I know they hate me. <laughs> they didn't even bring donuts to collect it. What the heck? You know, it's so <laughs> phase two. And then phase three where we all settle into being mere humans, flawed and with lots of foibles, loved by God and saved by grace, bringing our broken selves before the presence of Jesus in this communities that we belong to. And we find the life of our community there in front of Jesus amidst 
one another. Just think about the disciples. Just for three years, you know, these guys were stuck with each other. You know, I mean, Jesus called them all. And they're like, yeah, this would be great. Awesome. I'm going to leave the fish behind. Here I am, Jesus. And then they look around and there's these stinky ham-handed fishermen. There's tax collectors and there's wild-eyed zealots, the yes-men and the naysayers, even the betrayers. And they're jockeying for prestige and position and they're fumbling their way forward into the kingdom. particular place, a peculiar people, and God's got them exactly where he wants them. Bob Goff says this, love difficult people because you are one of them. <laughs> but we live in an age of convenience and consumption and instant gratification. We fortify ourselves to preserve our comfort and our autonomy. We want to be undisturbed if we're honest. And there's an author named Daniel Grothy, and he's got a beautiful book called The Power of Place. He says this, people are great purifiers, but we don't always stay around long enough for that purification to take place. He goes on to say, the fruit of the Spirit does not magically appear. He says, no, we burst forth with patience after suffering long stretches with insufferable people. He says, we become good on the other side of people treating us badly. And we extend love to people who are mean and we demonstrate self-control as people come at us to vent their anger. This is how the fruit of the spirit gets developed in us, he says. But here's my caveat though, I just wanna say this clearly. I am not talking about domestic violence in this. I am not talking about exploitation and abuse. And I think it just needs to be said, we need to say this more from the pulpit, that if you or your children are currently in harm's way, then it's okay to be safe. And you could just reach out to any of the town pastors and bring support to you and help extricate you from that situation, right? Just to be clear, that's my caveat. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about abuse and exploitation. I am just talking about the day-to-day -day rubbing together of regular old sinners doing life together, right? That's how we grow in patience. We get the cranky mother-in-laws, you know? We get, I mean, <laughs> or whatever, you know? God bless all of our mother-in-laws. And um, <laughs> Grothy goes on to say, he says, the muck of someone else's immaturity slowly composts and ends up fertilizing faithfulness within us. And over time, the fruit of the Spirit bursts forth in our lives if we stay the course and let that process work its way through. Why is it hard to stay the course? Why do we run? Well, we don't really, anybody here really love conflict? Woo no. <laughs> yes, I've learned that about you British people. Anyway, so, <laughs> so we avoid conflict. It's easier to just cut ties and leave. You just ghost them, right? Just quietly unfriend them off of Facebook. They won't even know that I'm not there anymore. <laughs> we don't want to do the hard work of having the courageous conversations and working out our difficulties together. We don't want to look in the mirror and see how we're contributing ourselves to the mess. So we ghost people, we check out, we switch churches. Here's the thing. <laughs> God is so good. He's so good with us. He is so, he's so invested in us becoming like his son it, that if, if we, the first go around we miss an opportunity to grow like Jesus and we kind of like exit stage left, God's like, yeah, no problem. They'll go to the next situation and we'll do it again. You know, if you don't get it the first time, you get an opportunity to do it another time or another time or another time because there's a beautiful good news in Philippians 1 verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You can't run away from it. God wants his invitation to all of us is to become more like Jesus. He's so committed to that. And so let's... I, yeah, <laughs> anyway, I'm aware of the time I could go on. So let's, let's just continue 
to stir up one another in good deeds. Let's continue to sharpen one another like iron sharpening iron. And let's continue to stay the course. Let's stick with it, guys. Even if it's hard, let's do the work with one another. Because life in community is messy. It's inevitable. You know, it just that's just the way it is. It's the way it's designed because it's the way that we are going to learn to die to self and to become more like Jesus. Knowing that in this particular place, with this peculiar people, God has us right where he wants us. Amen. We're now going to hear from Jonathan, who's a member of the prayer community, and he's going to share a little bit about what's been going on in schools. So over to Jonathan. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Today, I would like to pray for our schools. Father God, I pray above all for our schools and colleges that they would be safe places. Places where children and young people can grow and mature, confident that no harm will come to them. Father, I pray that our schools and colleges would be places of learning, places where pupils can be inspired by their teachers, where they can learn from the environment that they're in, and that there would be a spirit of community that they can learn from one another. Father, I pray for Christians within schools, both pupils and teachers and administrators, that they would be beacons of light, that together would bring hope and comfort in our schools. Psalm 20 verse 4 says, May he grant your heart's desire and make all your plans succeed. And Father, I pray schools and colleges would be places where seeds would be planted seeds of ideas and inspiration that would uh, drive our children and young people's lives to good works, works that are going to transform our communities and our society, works of hope, works of change, works of comfort and reconciliation. And I pray, Lord, that our schools would be places where children and young people can reach their full potential. And I pray that particularly for those who are more vulnerable, those who are struggling with various difficulties in learning, social interaction, language, mental health. Father, that you would put the support uh, mechanisms around those young people, that they can learn and learn well. Father, I want to thank you for teachers who give themselves so selflessly in the interests of their pupils, who work so hard. Father, I pray you would renew their strength. I pray you would fill them with inspiration and hope. And Father, I pray you'd give them the means, the resources to do their jobs well. I pray for heads of department and heads of teachers that they would lead with wisdom, that they too would be inspired and that they would find creative ways to help their schools succeed in the, the job of teaching and learning. And Father, I pray for administrators that they would steward resources wisely and for policy makers that they would provide those resources that are necessary and lead policy with wisdom so that our children and young people may grow up with hope and a future just as you planned. Father, I pray that you would pour out your blessing upon our schools and colleges this week that your love would flow through them and that lives would be changed. Amen. Well, it's been so great to have you with us. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, more information can be found on our website, emmausroad.com. But until next time, take care and God bless you.